here we are again, alive for another week of the Cassius Morris Show. I want to thank you for tuning in. I'm your host. Who the hell else would it be talking off the top, honestly, realistically? Hey, it's Thursday, April 5th, 2018. It's 2.13 p.m., and I am super happy and energized once again because it's been a wonderful week of radio and podcasting. As I discussed last week on the solo show, I was experiencing a bit of a lull in the flow of episodes and interviews that were coming in, and I was talking about those peaks and valleys that you can't really gauge or expect beforehand, and just how you deal with that and roll with those punches. And I'm certainly happy to say that out of nowhere, in the span of a couple days, we're back on a roll, and I just did this interview that you're about to hear Yesterday, I did a two-hour radio show yesterday over at Comic Genius CJSR, and then I just did another crazy interview that's going to come out next week, which I'm about to announce, and I'm doing another one tomorrow. So I'm just doing insane amounts of interviews, insane amounts of podcasts, four in one week, and keeping busy, keeping myself working, that's what I really enjoy. So two quick things off the top before we get into this interview with our guest Um, Comic Genius is the radio show that I do with Norm Shaw, DJ, comedian, and hypnotist here in Edmonton, Canada, and we do the show every Wednesday, 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. The show is great. It's a comedy show. We play comedy clips. We have local comedians coming in talking about uh, the comedy scene in Edmonton as well as worldwide, and we also have comics from other scenes call in and actually come into the studio. We also take listener calls and a lot of fun stuff. If you're a night owl, it's a great show to listen to. And if you're not, we actually have every episode now put up as a replay in the radio archive that we have made available. So if you go to Comic Genius, and that's genius spelt with a J on purpose, comicgenius.ca, you can check out our archive and the page to listen live Wednesdays, 12 to 2 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So that's the first announcement. The next announcement is that I want to announce next week's, next week's podcast guest right off the top here in advance because I don't usually do that. I, I try to keep it a surprise. I like to, to sort of drop it as a secret so that you can look into your podcast feed or YouTube feed on a weekly basis and say, oh, he talked to such and such. That's cool. But in this case, I want to let everybody know I got the chance to speak with a really interesting figure, an iconic figure of the 70s and 80s rock music scene. He's worked for and with the likes of Kiss for at least 15 years. He worked with Kiss, Prince, uh, Billy Idol, and many, many more as personal security being their bodyguard. And I had the chance to speak for about an hour with Big John Hart. And he is the one, if you've ever seen any photo or video of Kiss running, uh, you know, to and from a hotel or into a concert venue or whatever in the 70s or 80s before they were ever seen without makeup, anytime they were there and there was a bodyguard with them who was putting his hand up towards the camera or chasing the photographers away and stuff like that, that was him. That was Big John Hart. Uh, And he has an extensive amount of venue security as well as personal security for bands about 30 years in the industry, so I got to talk to him, and he also has a new book that just came out, so look forward to that, that's on next week's episode of the Cassius Morris Show, and I'm really excited to release that, we're on a roll, and there's so much more happening, yesterday I started emailing all of the artists that I'm trying to interview at Rolling Loud, so basically every artist on the list, um, it's a three day list with about 30 some people on each day, so we're spacing it out, in different segments of each day for the people we're emailing in different chunks uh, based on their level and where they will be playing at the festival and all those kinds of things. So I'm trying to put that into place and I'm really hoping I can make this come through not just for myself but for the listeners out here to have some crazy interviews to bring back from Miami. So that is an ongoing saga that I will keep you guys updated with all the way through. But the plan is in action. The wheels are in motion. I've also applied for my official media slash press photo pass, which I'm really hoping they will allow me to have. You know, and I, I might have mentioned this on another episode 
I don't believe I did, but I might have. That's what cannabis does to you. Um, <laughs> is that most festivals, they require that you send in, a lot of the times, a letter of assignment from an editor, um, a cover letter, you know, some kind of thing from someone higher up who is assigning you to go and do a story at this event. Yet this event, all they were requiring is 15 to 20 concert photography samples from you and a website. So the Cassius Morris show, of course, goes above and beyond that. And it, of course, demonstrates the importance of taking every little gig. You know, if I wouldn't have taken every concert photography gig basically that I've been handed that I could physically get myself to, I wouldn't have even had the 15 to 20, whereas now I have, you know, upwards of 40 samples to choose from. So it's very important, and that's just the quick message that I want to give off the top of this episode. Go for what you want, grab it, take it, make it yours, and do your best to earn it from someone if you have to, but if you can't earn it from someone, go take what's yours. That's the message here. I want to let you guys know about our sponsors before we get into this interview and a hilarious comedy clip. The show is sponsored by BlackoutX.com. Calm. If you want to be forgetful like me and by vaping cannabis, you can go ahead and log on to blackoutx.com and check out all of their vaporizers. They actually have vaporizers for herb and all kinds of legal cannabis concentrates, waxes, shatter, all that delicious stuff that you can vape um, instead of smoke. You know, it's probably easier on your lungs to be vaping these substances. At least it gives your lung a break from the carcinogens in the smoke. Um, and yeah, you can also actually vape nicotine and non-nicotine e-juice out of different vapes on this website as well. So if you're smoking anything and considering either switching to vape or using vape part-time, check out blackoutx.com and use the promo code 420CMX at checkout. That's 420CMX at checkout and you're going to save 15% off all items courtesy of this podcast. So that's always Nice, and I hope you enjoy your Blackout X products while listening to this podcast. I have to say, if you do enjoy cannabis and you've never used it before listening to this podcast or during, I highly recommend it, pun intended, and I do make sure that the show flows well for that. So just a little tip for my listeners. I would I would take my word on that one for sure. We're also sponsored by, well, if they still want to sponsor us after this podcast and that commercial, um... Audible.com, and Audible is a service that I'm actually very fond of. They provide thousands and thousands of downloadable audiobooks that can be accessed at the tip of your fingers on any device, iPhone, any kind of phone, any kind of computer or tablet. If you can access the internet, you can access Audible. This is a monthly subscription service, but if you want to check it out and just download a free audiobook directly to any of the devices that I just mentioned... Go to audibletrial.com slash TCMS. That's audibletrial.com slash TCMS for the Cassius Morris Show. And we will give you a free audiobook download absolutely free of charge from yours truly once again. So I hope you guys take advantage of these goodies and this freebie that we're offering. It is being offered every week if you're a new listener, and we certainly hope you take advantage of that. Last thing I wanted to discuss and bring up really quick, the YouTube channel. We're trying to grow that. We do run the Cassius Morris show as an audio and video show every week. Even if there isn't new video content every week, we still upload the audio podcast at the very least to the YouTube channel. So there's always going to be some kind of content weekly. If you use YouTube or have an account and even don't use it, please subscribe to the Cassius Morris show. We're trying to reach a thousand subscribers so that we can start being recognized as a creator on YouTube, as an official creator, and getting paid for our content. You need 1,000 subscribers. We're just about at 800, so if you follow us uh, or subscribe to us on YouTube, The Cassius Morris Show, that would be great. And of course, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash Cassius Show. I'm on Twitter, at Cassius Morris, and Instagram, of course, I'm really active there, and on Twitter, at Cassius Morris underscore. And I'm tempted to spell out my name, but I feel like if you have access to this show and you're listening to this show and you've somehow found it uh, and you didn't have to figure out how to spell my name during that process, 
then I think I can just leave it to you at that point. I think you uh, you can probably figure it out because that's awfully bizarre. So make sure to follow me on there and subscribe. And of course, uh, leave a five-star review for this podcast, how well I'm at it, if you listen on Stitcher or iTunes, Apple Podcast. So thank you very much. Now, we're going to get into this interview with our special guest. This guest, oh, this was, it's one of the guests that is just sort of dropped from the heavens. You know, it's just a, a podcast gift that was delivered to me. This gentleman uh, first followed me on Twitter after hearing me, I, I guess as he tells me, as you're about to hear in this interview, on the Adam Carolla podcast when I was doing a call-in appearance. He heard me on there, and we started speaking over the internet, and years later, a couple years later, here we are doing the podcast. So it's really cool. Tommy Campbell is a fantastic comedian. He's been touring all over the world for years. He's an absolute professional and recently he released his latest record called Stupid Shaming, which is absolutely hilarious. We're about to hear a clip from it here in a moment. And not only that, he's actually the official, one of two official support acts for Jim Jeffries on the road. So Jim Jeffries, of course, incredibly highly respected comedian. Not only that, but Tommy is also a actor, writer, and director. He's acted in movies such as The Dark Knight as well as television shows as such as Doctor Who and Supernatural. He's been in other, other movies too. We talk about a scene that he did with Emily Blunt and Tom Cruise that was particularly difficult to shoot. That's around the end of this podcast. We talk about that. He's been in movies with Matt Damon. Uh, we talked about you know Christopher Nolan being in a movie directed by him, you know The Dark Knight, what that was like seeing himself on, on screen in IMAX and going to the you know red carpet premieres and things like that. Uh, we also talked about internet trolls and haters uh, and how Tommy has been giving it to Donald Trump, roasting him on Twitter for a long time and has received a large amount of, of uh, fame and notoriety from that uh, and just speaking his mind in general. He's, he's not afraid to speak his mind. He's not afraid to say what's on, in, what's, uh, how he feels and that's something I respect from anybody. So I figured I'd have him on this podcast to uh, talk about it, say his piece and it was a really interesting conversation. So I want to get into a clip from Tommy's new record. This is streaming on SiriusXM uh, comedy channels right now, so congratulations to Tommy on that. And it's also available on Spotify and Apple Music. It's called Stupid Shaming, so go check it out. Stream that, whatever you need to do. And this is a clip that I found particularly funny, and we're going to go straight from this clip into the interview here on the Cassius Morris Show. So thank you for tuning in, and here's Tommy Campbell with Wake Up Call on TCMS. Most of the time I'm on my own when I travel though, and I was uh, recently in Winnipeg and I'm checking into my hotel, and the lady at the front desk said to me, uh, do you want a wake up call? And I was like, I'm at the Holiday in Winnipeg. This is my wake up call. <laughs> I mean, shit's not exactly going fantastic <laughs> if I'm here. Don't get me wrong, I love your tooth. That is one beautiful brown tooth. <laughs> and I appreciate that you have free Wi-Fi. I know, only in the lobby. But, but this, it's depressing for me to be here. You have to understand that. And she's like, mm-hmm, whatever. She gives me my room key. Room 430. I get up to the fourth floor. And when everyone goes to a hotel, they know when you get to the floor, you got to look and find where your room is. You got to look at the little map on the wall. There's no app for it. You got to use the thing. So I have room 430. I get there. It says this way. Rooms 400 to 415. This way, rooms 416 to 429. <laughs> 430. 429. So back down in the lobby, I go up to old One Tooth, and I'm like, uh, yeah, I think you made a mistake because you wrote 430 on my room key, but the sign only goes up to 429. And she says to me, uh, yeah, those signs are wrong, eh? And I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, they're wrong. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me when you sent me up there? She's like, oh, I guess I didn't think of it. I never do. I'm like, well, why don't you fix the sign? She goes, well, hey, it's kind of a big job. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, it's wrong on every floor. And I'm like, what? How old is this hotel? She's like, six years. 
how many floors are there? She's like, five. I'm like, fuck, you're dumb on every level. This is insane. You've had all this time and you couldn't fix this. Give me a Sharpie. I will take the elevator up to every floor. 30, 30, 30, it's that simple. And some of you are like, oh, wow, did you really go off on this lady? Yes, I did, because I think if someone sucks that bad at their job, you should tell them. We have to start stupid shaming people. If someone's an idiot, let them know. Stupid shame them. Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous in any job to be this stupid. Like, I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna get to my hotel room after the show. I'll be half drunk, I'll be a bit tired. I'll try and have a little, you know, a little jerk off for, it's, it's a sleeping pill, let's be honest. You know, it helps you sleep, you know, but there's no Wi-Fi, so I have to use my imagination. So I'll probably have like some sort of like chest pain. <laughs> And I will, I'll be in pain, I'll phone 911, I'll be like, 911, uh, this is Tommy Campbell. Yeah, the comedian. Uh, I'm at the Holiday Inn, I think I'm having a heart attack. Ah, uh, from 4.30. And the Winnipeg paramedics will show up, all right, let's save a life, eh? <laughs> beep, beep, they get in the elevator, get up to the fourth floor, and be like, all right, what room did that fellow say he was in? 4.30, okay, to 4.29. Beep, beep. Hey, uh, dispatch, this is, uh, this is Dale at the Holiday Inn. That comedian fellow, what room did he say he was in? Yeah, 4.30. <laughs> it only goes up to 4.29. Funny guy, prank called, boys, let's get out of here, and I'm fucking dead. <laughs> That's why you have to stupid shame people. We're here on the Cassius Morris Show, and we have a very special guest on the line. Where are you calling from today? I'm in Vancouver. Vancouver, Mr. Tommy Campbell, how are you? I'm fantastic, buddy. It's nice to finally get on your show. We've swapped some messages for a while. Yeah, we have been talking for quite a while. Um, I thank you for coming on and, and carving out the time. Are, are you been uh, doing some meetings and things like that over in Vancouver? Is it a business thing right now? I live here now. Okay, right. Yeah, so I live here. So in that sense, I'm always doing some meetings and business um, and also a lot of hanging out. Right, as, lots of hang as, out. As, you, as you do here on the West Coast. Very good. It's one of my favorite places to be, you know. Um, and I often try to find excuses to go out there, i got to say. Well, you, you, you know, you, your next excuse would be you have a place to stay. That's right. Hey, very, very much appreciated there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's Anytime, so much that's been going know. on with you. You know, I think we should just, just jump right into it. Of course, the most recent album, Stupid Shaming, uh, is now airing on Sirius XM, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's on, you can get it on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, like all the regular things. And then it's also uh, got added to the rotation uh, on Sirius XM's comedy channels, including uh, Raw Dog, which is their really big American one. Um, and it's also uh, on, we'll be on Canada Laughs, which is our like native Canadian station, uh, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. But it's, it's pretty cool when your stuff does cross the border. So I was pretty happy about that. And as you should be, congratulations for sure. And for those who don't really know, who aren't familiar, what does that mean for a comic who's, who's out there doing stand-up, actively touring, to be on these channels? Because this isn't something that every comic just gets. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good uh, tip of the hat um, uh, that, you know, that, that they heard your stuff and they wanted to play it, you know, that it, that it made through it, it, it passed all the, it jumped through all the hoops. I think with like, see, with like, uh, with Spotify and Apple Music and stuff, you're kind of hustling and you're, you're telling people here, check out my album or they come and see me live. And I say, Hey, I just released a new album. If you want to go listen to it. Right. Um, so that means they have to go and seek it out. Mm -hmm. What's amazing with satellite radio is there's like, I don't know. I, th I think it's something like 30 million subscribers. So, you know, when they're playing a track, it, it's not, not, not all 30 million are tuned to raw dog, but, you know, a, a massive chunk of people are hearing that and, you know, it's just incredible. And then that will turn them on to you. And so it's a, yeah, it's a really cool thing, man. It's a really cool thing. Yeah, that's interesting. And, uh, you know, that's something I got to experience to a certain level, at least doing the Adam Carolla show, you know, he has his 1.2 million followers or listeners per episode. 
And even though, you know, not all million of those people are going to go follow you on Twitter or go do something like that or go see your show or whatever it may be, they will remember you when they hear about you, they'll associate it with that. And uh, a good percentage of them will actually go and actively do something. So 30 million, you know, increasing those odds by so much. I mean, that's something that must just feel remarkable, really. Yeah, it's really interesting, and and and, and ex- yeah, it's a very good comparison with Adam's show because those people weren't tuning into Cassius Morris; they were tuning into Adam Carolla. And, That's right. And then they and then they experienced you, and then you port over some of those fans to yours. So yeah, it's 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 really cool. And I mean, this is my second album. My first one was called Hamster Pimp, and that mm-hmm. came out in 2016. Um, and that was on regular rotation on Canada Laughs, and that also made it to uh, Raw Dog Comedy. So that's on that was already on two stations. Um, my goal is to release an album every year. So Stupid Shaming came out just before the end of uh, 2017. So I was happy to to watch that slowly um, make its way through the different stations and and stuff. But uh, yeah, I completely completely hear you with the adam thing because the reason i know who you are is because i was a long time loyal listener of adam's show and my wife and i are sitting sitting there in the yard having a beer listening to the podcast and then yeah i got this cash this guy wants we want to talk to this all right let's see what he got and he was like i can remember it like it was yesterday was completely taken aback um by by how well you know, you were, and, and so were we. And I just, I was just wild at it. I'm like Edmonton, I'm freaking out listening to this, you know, this this is the weirdest thing ever, but it's also fantastic. And then because of that, yeah, I was where he were and then heard you subsequently. Um, and then, and then, Oh gosh, I was listening to it. I got, I, I, I was listening to another episode and I think it was with um, Fitzsimmons. Mm-hmm, yeah. And you, you interviewed him, right? You, yeah. I did. And I called in when he was on Corolla, too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would that was it, right? He was saying, like, yeah, you know, like, this this kid wanted to do his interview with me, and the, they came to the hotel room and stuff. And yeah. Yeah, he said he was great. And I was like, this – and, and I was like, oh, that made me a fan of his. Right. The fact that he had the time to do that. Yeah. And was cool about stuff. So, yeah, I really um, I really like all the exposure um, that Adam gave you. And what I think is really cool about it is, I mean, he's I don't know what the word for it is, but uh, discerning or, um, you know, he always talks about the second date. I don't know if you heard him talk about that you know Mm -hmm. but like for me like you know if i if i play a really big comedy club and i head headline or whatever it's not that i did it it's that they want me back to do it again that's right and so i mean that says everything right so um if there's anyone that's just (laughs) fucking vicious it's him yeah (laughs) oh my gosh yeah i know like pretty brutal right so the fact that uh you know he really liked you and saw something in you and kept having you, you know, call back in and stuff I thought was very, very cool. Well, so. I appreciate that. And, you know, there is something to that. And it's funny, at that time, I was 16, newly 16. I think I talked to him for the first time around my birthday, actually. And I hadn't listened to the old Loveline stuff and, you know, the old K-Rock clips and all that stuff, which I've, I've listened to now and I've become very familiar with. Um, I just hadn't heard it. And I don't think I really realized fully how uh you know just bulldoze over everybody you know how that's how much of an attitude like that he really really has and uh how bold he really can be so I think that that almost helped me you know that the fact that I was a little more naive to that than I could have been made me maybe have a little bit more false confidence you know oh absolutely sometimes the less you know is 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 much better yeah. um even even like sometimes if i'm auditioning for a television show or something and i you know i i i try not to look up you know um who's directing it or in case they're there and i'm thinking oh gosh i don't know it just it's just too much information in your head um just be in the moment as much as possible yeah if Absolutely. you can. And so have you been to 
um, have you had a chance to actually go to his studios yet? I have not. I've actually never even been to the States yet. That is coming next month. <laughs> oh, wow. Good for you. Where are you going? That's going to be Miami, Florida for the Rolling Loud Music Festival doing a bunch of interviews. Very cool. Very cool. And you, But you have been to Corolla's studio, right? Uh, yeah, I've been on... I've been on two shows there. Uh, so yeah, I've been there a couple times. The first time was Chris Loxamana. Uh, mm-hmm. he has a show on, the, he's one of the longtime guys from the network and he has a show on the network, uh, called, uh, resume. And, uh, it's also uh, called the water cooler. Mm-hmm. And so I was on resume podcast. It was one-on-one with him and it was almost three hours long. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, resume is a really interesting concept for a show that he had where he talks to people in show business and they discuss all the jobs they had before they are who they are now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we went on there and I, I happened to work my whole life when I, well, before I was in this business, you know, so, uh, we, we, we literally went through my resume <laughs> from, from, you know, I started working full time when I was 14. So that's why we had a lot to talk about. Yeah. It's a long resume. Yeah. It's a long resume. So it was the longest show. I think it was going to go up. I think it was almost up for one of those end of the year Corolla awards or the longest podcast. But nice. anyway, it was silly. So I went and did that, and uh, he's absolutely a tremendous guy and an incredible musician. Um, if you do listen to his show, check out. Um, he has a band called Loxie, L-A-X-I, and uh, befriended him because of that. And so when I'm back in Los Angeles, I get in touch with him, and I did the show with Corolla's wife, uh, Lynette. Um, right. Has one called the Corolla Drinks After Show that's on Facebook Live. Uh and that's with a couple other guys from the studio, and we drink beer and go through the news, and it, it's fun. So, yeah, I'm lucky to have been there a couple times, and whenever they're doing a, a show or something within range, you know, yeah, uh, I've gone to hang out and see them in Seattle and Portland and stuff. They used to do these bar crawls. I don't know if they still do them. I went to one in the summer in seattle it was absolutely amazing i bet well if you want to get smashed with ray oldhoffer for a night <laughs> who doesn't honestly. that's why i sent you that picture of me and him playing beanbag whatever cornhole whatever that game is so we had a blast so <laughs> this is a very ray activity i gotta say very very <laughs> a lot of yelling i just remember being on this patio at this bar in seattle who don't know what hit them just all these people showed up yeah but it was a bar crawl but like in a good way because it was all like adults it wasn't like you know like fired up you know 18 year olds right like it was all pretty civilized people but still we're you know we descended on them and uh they had like this outdoor game of jenga where the blocks are like the size of bricks and you know you build it like six feet tall and we just showed up we'd been there 10 seconds in raid already like drop kicked someone's game over (laughs) (laughs) it was i was like this is awesome this is exactly what you'd want. Just a couple just pre-drink same. mangrias, maybe. Yes, absolutely. Well, the <laughs> same the same way that when you when you said that you know Gene Simmons is exactly how you want him to be. Yeah. You know, with the jeans and the jacket and the hair and the sunglasses, Ray's exactly as you want him to be. Right. He's absolutely buck wild and hilarious, and you just don't know what's going to happen next. You know, and a really lovely guy. So I. Every time I've done one of those, I've just had a riot with him. That's super cool. Yeah, you know, there's certain people you just, they have to have certain traits or else you definitely will be disappointed. So I know what you mean there. And I'm uh, assuming, I don't know, this is just, I'm assuming your listeners have read uh, not Taco Bell material. So that's, that's why if, if, you know, if they are familiar even with who I'm talking about, I mean, maybe they listened to his podcast with Adam. The, I think uh, most of them probably uh, will know him. Yeah, yeah, because just that not tell like all of it's weird how we, anyway we got time with Adam, but all of all of the funniest stories in Adam's book is not Adam, it's right. Ray. Everything is Ray that's hilarious in that book. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's so, true. It is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like look at okay, look at Seinfeld. Like Seinfeld wasn't very funny. He was surrounded by very funny people. Now Adam is funny, but it's like. It's the it's sometimes it's just these wild characters 
on the perimeter that make everything so exciting. And Ray exactly. is that guy. Yeah, Ray's that guy. That's totally true. You know, I feel like Adam has found a way to his his radio persona is is somewhat of a wild guy. Probably more so on Loveline, I'd say. But it's 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 a very calculated and controlled approach. And I think that's what separates him from some of these other wild radio guys. You know, some of them are just unhinged, and it makes for that great radio. Uh, but you know, you're never going to see Adam being you know Artie Lang status or something like that. Well, what I um, you know what I always took from Adam was that he doesn't give a fuck. I'm guessing it. Can I swear on this? Certainly. It's, it's every, I don't know why I asked that. I always listen to podcasts and I'm like, of course you can. Yet it's, I ask it, too when I'm on shows, but, which but is then the funniest I ask, thing. But I usually ask after I, you know, <laughs> called everyone dickheads. Right. Um, it's like, well, he just doesn't care because he – It's his own thing. Like, no one's going to fire him, you know? And he knows, regardless of whether people agree or disagree with his opinion, um, I'm sure that when people agree to advertise on the show, they're like, this is what you're getting into. You know, like, you know, (laughs) this is how it is. Um, You know, we're not going to bend to uh you know we're not going to avoid any subjects so they tell the advertisers be... here's our terms yeah here's our terms so um and that's very rare um that someone can be like that because most people in our business are terrified <laughs> they right. are like most comedians um like i'm like i'm like the only comic that will ever say like We'll, we'll we'll make a note saying like I think one of the lights is burnt out. And, oh, it's been like that for a while, and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's this, the stage light's important. It lets people know where the fucking show is. Yeah, and it lets people see. The main thing is it lets people see your eyes. You know, if if you're if you're being at all dry on stage with jokes and they can't see your eyes, they don't know you're joking and stuff. Right. But, but comics, even something like as simple as that, like hmm, maybe we should point out that the light's gone. So many are so scared to say anything because they honestly think they're going to be like, you're complaining, you're fired. You're never yeah. playing here again. Whereas I just always view things as being constructive. You know, I never I always say, I never want to lose on a technicality. Right. You know, I don't want to have a bad weekend because the mic kept cutting out and I didn't want to say anything. I'd rather mention it early or fucking go get my own if I have to, you know. Right. I want the, I want to have the best experience because I want those people to experience me the right way so they can come back. And I don't want them to waste their time, you know, with with a, a shitty room. But you'd be, you'd be amazed, man. <laughs> I, uh, most people won't say anything. The yeah. like, comics just won't say anything. You know, the, honestly, their paycheck, they could get be paid less than they were told and they won't say anything. Right. That's uh, the whole business. Everyone's terrified. So someone like Adam, I really um, respect and learn from in that sense. Just, you know, don't be so scared. Just, Definitely. you know, voice don't be afraid to voice your opinion in any way you know yeah no he certainly is a great teacher teacher in that uh, respect it's funny you mentioned that you know the fear in the business of comedy and you know I haven't done stand up yet it's something I aspire to do I've actually been writing some jokes right now uh, lately but uh, I do have quite a bit of experience in the clubs of course having worked at a major comedy club for about two and a half years at one point and that's one thing that I really didn't expect upon working behind the scenes of comedy is that it's not a cheery, happy place. It's actually a place where most of the people are scared. And if you're not scared, you're the one making people scared. So it's uh, <laughs> was that something that you were taken aback by once you started working in comedy? Or is that something that you sort of just expected as the nature of that business? Well, that's uh, that's always the thing. People, when, when most of the times I meet people... You know, I, I try so fucking hard not to tell them I'm a comedian. Like if I'm just at like a dinner party or something. Yeah. Because all of a sudden everyone wants you to like be hilarious and make them laugh or something. Uh, 
you know, it's it's just like kind of thing. Like, oh, you're a mechanic. Let me go get my car so you can fucking fix it. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, I tell don't me know, a few jokes. Like, yeah, it's, and, and well, people always want to tell you jokes, and they're always horrible and racist. They're like, I got one for you, and you're like, oh god, <laughs> please don't, please don't. You should put this in um, your act. That's the best. One. Oh yeah, you know, I get that twenty four seven. Um, and and even at the worst worst times ever, I'm people are like, oh, how are you? I'm like, oh no, I just got back. My aunt passed away and I had to pick up her ashes because I'm like the closest family, uh, in the neighborhood, yada, yada, like in this province and stuff. And they're like literally standing there waiting for me to like say something funny. And I'm like, (laughs) that's it. This is just what happens here are ashes. I have to get an urn now. And then what happened? Yeah. And then what? And you're like, and so, (laughs) so, so because of that, people do listen to you differently. But in general, like, yeah, I mean, everyone, there's not like, you know, like when you're talking about comedy at a club level, there isn't necessarily like enough work yeah. to really, for everyone to really make a living. So everybody's fighting for like this last slice of pizza. Mm-hmm. So that's where part of the negative energy comes from, uh, right. like in part of the uh, intensity that you see, like the miserableness you see. So part of it's that, yeah. um, the other part is we're, we're treated fucking horribly in Canada, horribly. So not even let considered me just, an unofficial let, art form. Let me preface this to like your listeners that I've played in 35 countries. Okay. 35. Yeah. And of those 35, I would say Canada is the country that we're treated the worst in. Wow. Like, it's just, yeah, like, it's just bizarre. It's just bizarre. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying like, you know, we show up to the club and they spit on us, but yeah. I mean, I, I'll be headlining a club and I'll often have it where I've sat in the green room for an hour through the other acts mm-hmm. waiting to go on stage. And I still haven't, had anyone come say, can I get you a, just a bottle of water or beer? Yeah, that's common. Like, like that's, but like, so that's how I was used to being, like, that's how starting out I thought comedy was. Like, oh, I just, like, if you're not used to being treated with respect, you just assume that's the normal. You know, every relationship is abusive, you know, <laughs> like yeah, basically, exactly. right. you know, and then you meet someone, you're like, oh, wow, you're not hitting me and calling me names. This is nice. Exactly. Um, so, so basically, uh, eventually, um, a few years into my being a comedian, I moved to, uh, London, England mm-hmm. because I'd heard, um, that there were more comedy clubs in London than there were in all of Canada. Wow. I didn't so, even know yeah. that. Yeah. Well, um, um, this is new information for you. I'm slowing it down. <laughs> I love it. So, so yes, there was more comedy clubs in London than all of Canada. And then, so I am a dual citizen. I had an Irish passport. It was the European union. Um, I was living in Toronto. I would recently broken up with a crazy chick. And so I literally just sold everything I owned, grabbed a duffel bag. Um, there was no like really Facebook or anything then. Yeah. It was, it was like totally different. Like to, to get like an apartment online, I had to use a Craigslist thing. And anyway, I just moved to London and I, I saw it immediately. I'm like, Oh, this is why like, uh, it, you know, like people were treated with respect. there, like comedians. And part of it was because there was so much work no one was fighting for that slice of pizza. There's pizza everywhere. So, so that's the main difference? Well, no, that's, it's one of them okay. was that the comics were, yeah, they weren't, they weren't all fighting over a scrap. So yeah. it took that animosity away. Like a lot of stuff, people, you know, people don't like another comedian for, they can't pin down the reason why. And maybe it's cause they're fucking similar and they're paranoid that, Hey, there's only, there's only enough work for two fat comics. I don't know. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so you go there and there's just work everywhere. Um, but the main thing was, uh, no waitresses. That's why comedy is so huge there. Really? Because, yeah, because when you do, when you go to a comedy club there, 
there's no tables. Okay. It's just the seating is in rows like a theater. Right. And the way it works is you get there, you go up to the bar, and you buy a drink. So you, you either get a beer or you can get a bucket of beers, you know, <laughs> bottle of wine or a glass of wine, right? And you go and you sit in your seat and the show starts and you have the full focus because there's not someone wandering through the audience going, anyone need a drink? Anyone need a right. drink? And with a fucking debit machine and stuff. And you can already decide, you know, I'm going to be drinking all night, so I'll just get a bottle or a bucket. Well, you do that. But the yeah. thing is, is that what, they're, what they do is between each act, they just have a 15-minute break. Oh, wow. And, that, and it's that simple. And now when North American comedians hear this, they're like, oh, the rhythm of the show is all gone. That's right. impossible. And I'm like, okay, of the 35 countries I've played in, they all take the British model. So when I play, when I've played in, in Tokyo and Hong Kong and Dubai and Singapore, it's all the British model. They don't take the North American model. They take the British model because that's the one that works the best. Yeah. So people are always scared. They're like, the rhythm's going to be gone. But the truth is, what's the best part of a concert? Probably when the, lights, the encore. <laughs> well, when the lights crash and, you know, when you've been waiting and all of a sudden the lights go out. And then welcome the stage and, you know, the yeah. show starts, right? Yeah. So so comics always think that like, oh, the rhythm's going to be gone. But it's like the actually the opposite because each time like there's a break, what they do is, you know, they, they have the announcement. The show's going to be starting. And then and then like the comedy store in London, like has a fucking smoke machine and lasers and shit. They mm. they it's like super exciting. You know, it's like you get to see the start of the concert many times because it gets people right back in the zone there's only two breaks anyhow it's not yes. like yeah. it's not like you have eight acts right like there's just often one or two breaks a show but what that means is like when my sister visited me in britain and saw me at the comedy store she said i've been watching you for years and that was the most enjoyable because i didn't have to sit trapped in my seat for two hours mm -hmm. having to take a piss and be terrified that like an MC was going to make fun of me and stuff. So that's the other thing too. Yeah. You, you'll often get called out for going to the bathroom and you know, when there were speakers at, at the club that I was working at in the bathroom, so then they would then mess with you from the stage when you're in the bathroom. So it's just it, people, that's actually really interesting that they do so it that way. Yeah. You'd have, you have 100% focus. So, so there's no waitresses going through the crowd, which means you're all sat close together. You have yeah. no tables, right? So, so it's like, it's like seeing a movie on a full house or like seeing that same comedy when it's like empty at a matinee, it's not as funny. So because of this, everyone's pushed close together. You have no waitressing, it, you have no waitress interrupting. And then, you know, like, Oh, I, I want to, I'm supposed to text someone. I got to make a phone call. You're like, this guy's going to be done in 20 minutes. Right. And on the, in the break, I'll have a quick piss. I'll grab another beer. And so you 100% have people's full attention. And if anyone, isn't giving that full attention like they're on the phone or anything they're out because they they have their opportunity there's no excuse there's no excuse right so they have no excuse so because of that um it, it just all becomes like full circle so because of that the shows are way better which means they put bigger acts on the shows they charge more money for them and people demand an amazing show yeah wow and so that's why it's so successful there and so again, like, you know, when you're in the, when you're in like the green room at like the comedy store in London, there's a fridge full of beer, water, coffee machine, you know, there's snacks, there's a, Jeez. there's a shower, there's just basic things that, you know, that's it. It's not hard to, to, you know, to, okay, for Friday night's acts, just throw a case of beer and some water and some Coke. Like, is it really that hard on your budget to do that? To, no. To make it simple and they just do stuff like that but it also makes you feel very welcome very appreciated and then that attitude carries out throughout the club down to customers on the stage because you you feel appreciated like I feel like you a know, performer i bet you feel like a performer right. so you can imagine like it just blew my mind when i went there yeah and uh and then you know when i lived there there was a few other uh, Canadians as well. And it was the same thing. They just all couldn't, couldn't believe it.
but the, but the Brits, that's all they knew. So <laughs> right. they, and they probably couldn't believe you did a full show, you know, just sitting there the whole time. They were like, "What is that? You know, don't you yeah, want to stretch uh, your legs?" Yeah, yeah. They would say like, "Yeah." They would say, "Oh." So they just you have just a waitress going through, and I'm like, "Yeah," <laughs> and and they're and they're putting the bill on the people while you're doing your closer, and they exactly they just blew their mind, you know. So. So, that was yeah. always like one of the ongoing things that I heard comics talk about is when checks come, you know, that's put such a damper on your act. And I always thought, you know, there should be a way to avoid that from happening. And, and I guess there is. Now, I wonder, did that minimize the talking in the audience throughout the show or, or like was that actually effective or do, were there still people talking and they just got thrown out mostly? Way, way better behaved audiences. Okay. Way better. Because, okay, you'll, you'll still get heckling, but it's like – the British hecklers are like on another level. They're, <laughs> I bet they're so witty, and they're like they're not just like some drunk Century Casino heckler just <laughs> yelling out some bullshit. They're very clever and very fast, and so you know you have to really rise to them when they happen. You have like but, six comics in the audience just waiting to, to tear up the comedian on stage. <laughs> like, well, there was a guy that used to like. There was a legendary guy named Malcolm Hardy that used to pay, not comedians, but some some guys he knew, to on certain nights he would give them free tickets and a bar tab to heckle the comedians. <laughs> but there's a big difference between like just someone talking and someone actually saying something incredibly witty. It doesn't mean you want to hear it. Yeah. Or, you know, when I wrote this joke, I, I thought, oh, I just hope someone fucking yells out in the middle of it. But right. when you see it done really well and replied to very well, it's impressive. So, yeah. I think it adds to the show if they do it and, and they just respond when the comedian addresses them and it doesn't go past that point. Where yeah, it is yeah, funny. yeah. And it moves on. Exactly. When it, when it gets hankered on and it's just, it, you know, we had this one situation where, you know, I saw this one guy and he was doing a back and forth with the comic and it started to become part of the show and it was funny. And then we ended up having to kick him out when there was about 15 minutes left because it just got overboard. You know, it, that's one thing that always has stunned me about people's behaviors in comedy clubs is that you can really watch adults turn into children and some of the behavior I've seen and I'm sure you've seen way worse probably you know because you, you have you have a lot more experience in clubs but it's just remarkable that people sometimes just change when they're in, in that audience what do you think that's about uh well all I know is that I mean it's part I mean is it alcohol is it I, I just think with with comedy in general my theory is that comedy okay so you got a table of four it was one of their – it was just like one person at that table's idea, right? Yeah. Like I want to go to the comic club this weekend or you know, I want to go see Tommy Campbell. And the other three just went, oh, OK, sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they're like not really as invested or you know, as intelligent with it. I don't know. Look at it like people that drink and then people that drink on St. Patrick's Day or New Year's Eve. It's like – people just turn into amateurs and idiots on those nights. Yeah. But those are the kind of people that you deal with every weekend at a comedy club. But I do find in like, you know, I've been doing this almost 20 years. It's generally, uh, the, like, the worst. If you're going to have someone that's really disruptive, mm -hmm. like in, if I look back at all my career, like the, like all the times it's almost always a lady. Right. And, She's super drunk and cannot be – like even if a guy's really wasted, if you shut him down, he will go down. Yeah. But girls will just keep crawling back up <laughs> and they just don't know until – you know, I, I had a girl throw up on her table. <laughs> she threw up on her table, like vomited all over her table at a club in Calgary. And she was still trying to get one over on me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, lady, you puked on your nachos. Like, <laughs> she's like, get me a towel, and I'm gonna say the most yeah, hilarious and, and joke right now. And she was like, and she's still trying to like try and get one up on me. I'm like, your nachos are covered in barf. The like, world has over. gotten one up on you, yeah, lady. It's it's over. But like, that's just <laughs> the thing. Um, 
some of the best audience members can be women as well. But I, when I look yeah. at like my worst, and that's because usually they're not heckling. They're just wasted and they're just talking at you, forgetting that there's a room full of people that paid to see you. Right. You exactly. know, you will get someone that be like, my brother, he went to that thing too. And he said, and you're like, Who, are you talking to me? I'm like, what, yeah. what is this? You know, <laughs> this isn't TV. <laughs> yeah, it really, really does happen. So, so yeah, it was, it was nice to see, you know, the way people were treated in Britain, uh, like the way performers were treated and also the way that they did deal with. Um, see, actually, I was at a comedy club this weekend here in Canada and it was Easter weekend and there was a table of girls with giant bunny ears and they thought that the show was supposed to be about them. <laughs> um, and they, Penis they, straws too? They were, no, they, they weren't. <laughs> I've seen that many <laughs> times. But they were just just obnoxious, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, to me, it's like, it's really offensive to like the people around you. Like as someone that's like a, a new parent myself, it's like, there's people in here. It's their one night to yeah. get out. You know, and they've, they've got a babysitter. They, you know, they had to get a designated driver. They've done whatever. They're here. And you six fucking idiots are just in the corner angry because we haven't made it our full-time job to chat with you exactly. about Jenny's birthday. Exactly. Like, and so the difference is, is in Britain, they would just throw those people out. Yeah. But in Canada, they are so scared of their audience. Like they're oh, yeah. so scared. You know, I was saying like, what? Well, just deal with them. Like as I'm waiting to go on and watching them, I'm like, You're, they're just going to keep doing this. They're going to get worse. It's going to ruin it for all these other people. But they're so scared that that these people are going to leave them a bad review or never come back. Right. And my friend uh, Lee ran a comedy club in England. And whenever he had someone really bad, he would say, that's it. You're out. And I remember this guy stood up and said, like, fuck you, mate. I'm never coming back here. And I'm going to tell my friends never to come back here. And he said, good. And the guy's like, what? He's like, I don't want you. I don't want your friends because if your friends are like you – they're going to be talking and obnoxious, and that's not who we want. Right. And so, like, that's the complete opposite of how they handle things here, where they'll just let people basically ruin a show um, because they're so scared. Like, oh, you know, they'll never yeah. come back. They don't realize these aren't the people you want. <laughs> you exactly. Know? Here, it's like you can pay them 20 bucks and tell them to go fuck themselves, but it's like they paid 20 bucks, so just let's seat them and get them some drinks. You know, it's... It's insane, you know, and, and yeah, especially they, when you're hiring people like me to throw them out. You know, it may not be the most effective thing either. I'm not necessarily Johnny Bravo uh, here. Very interesting. <laughs> very interesting observation. I mean, That's the true. other thing there. Well, uh, very interesting you said that. We had some rowdy people that after the show ended, they were on the stage trying to take pictures and stuff. Yeah. And one of the persons at the club said to like one of the bartenders, get those people off the stage. And I'm like... That guy's five two and one twenty. What do you like? What, what do you? It's dangerous, right? Like, yeah. So again, in other places that I've been, they actually do have real security, like right. actual, the same people you'd see outside a nightclub, and that really helps. Yeah. Because I don't think you should put it on, you know, some young waitress trying to make money for college to throw to throw out eight wasted rugby players. Right. Um. And also, like, as a comedian, I've seen a lot of crap go down in comedy clubs. And, like, in Britain, you knew that at least you had the security there. Because when, when you're on stage, you're blinded by the lights. You can't really see much what's going on. Yeah. And sometimes, this all of a sudden, oh, gosh, this guy's trying to climb on the stage or something. But, again, you can't, you, you know, you can't, you can't put a waitress or a bartender uh, in charge of getting them off. But here, for some reason... You know, uh, we do so, and that's paired with n not having the proper training for those people when they are in those situations, which makes the entire situation more dangerous than it would have been in the first place. Even you know, if you don't have the proper training, which I didn't, you know, I was at risk of getting hurt many, many times, and uh, but you know, 
it's just it's a really interesting environment, you know, overall. And I think that you just learn so much from being in that environment in so many different ways, you know. It's not just Ab- it's, it's multifaceted. A- absolutely. There's there's a lot you can take in, but like as I just will say, yeah. like that's that experience is based on how that one club operates. You know, like they're not all the same, but mm-hmm. it's good to be exposed to some. And again, maybe some people hear this and they, you know, they might think I'm complaining or something, but I'm just being constructive talking about like, it's just fascinating to me. Like most comedy clubs to me, when I play them, I'm like, it's just an episode of Bar Rescue. Like yeah. I just, I'm just looking around going like, I, I, I can't believe there's even people here. Yeah. Like, like it's just that falling upwards thing because how many things are just run terribly and done wrong. And, you know, the amount of times you're, they'll, they'll share like a, the, you know, they'll, they'll Facebook or something that you're coming there and they put the wrong weekend an old picture, you name mm-hmm. it, man, dead links. Typos. And you're just like, it's that Adam Kroll thing. What's your real job? Because it can't be this, yeah. you know? <laughs> and again, it's just, like I said, you just don't want to lose on a technicality. You just want to have things set up so you can have the best show possible. Now, back to talking again about fear and nerves. Yeah. When I meet someone, when I'm doing a weekend with someone and they have their feet up and zero nerves at all, zero anything, I'm like, oh, I know why you're like this. Because you do the exact same jokes every weekend. Mm -hmm. And so... If you're always playing hits, well, you're just you know you're gonna knock it out of the park every time, so you're not gonna be scared. Right. Whereas I'm like, I'm I'm fearless in the sense that I try huge chunks of new material every time I go on stage, and I've tried I've tried new stuff in front of eight thousand people before. Like I wow. just when I'm when I'm opening for Jim Jeffries, I've I've been like this just happened to me of this, you know, small story or a one liner. I'll, I'll say it. I don't care. I'll just put it out there. So mm-hmm. like I have that fearlessness to try it, but I am totally nervous because I'm like, gosh, you know, like it would be so much easier if I just, you know, did what you know over. works. If I, if I said, if I said like a couple things off my first album, yeah, but like, you know, you don't move forward from anything like that. So if you ever meet comics that are like super chilled and stuff, it's it's cause they do the same shit every week. Oh, that's and so true. I'm, you know, I'm in the green room and I'm literally just looking over some notes on my iPhone going, like, Oh shit. Yeah. That, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, we can add I'm, this tonight. Yeah. 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 I'm going to add this, you know, like, you know, I, I, I had a full new story that I did last weekend and it was rusty on Thursday, and by Saturday it was getting like five applause breaks. But it was wow. still good. It was still really good on Thursday. But by Saturday, and I'd never said it before, and it was something that happened to me on Tuesday. That's killer. Yeah, That's so and, cool. It must keep you keep you you know growing as a comedian all the time. It, it it does, but like the fire that was lit under my ass was was constantly opening for Jim Jeffries. Yeah. So. Um, because every time we play a market, I have to do all new material. And when did that start and how long has it been going? Uh, it's coming up on five years now. Wow. So, so like I've played, you're, 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 you are in Edmonton still, right? Yes. So I've played your Northern Jubilee, I think, um, three different tours there, yeah. three or four. And then each one, two to four shows depends. Like our last one, I think in Alberta was we did five shows in Calgary. He sold out five shows of the Jubilee, the Southern Jubilee Auditorium, wow. which I think is, I think it's about 3,000 a show, 3,000 people beautiful a show. theaters. And they're identical. Um, they're identical. So, so basically, when I started, um, like, to, so this makes sense to people, people listening all of a sudden, I'm talking about Jim Jeffries, but Jim and I are old friends because Jim went from Australia to London. Yeah to do comedy at the same time I went from Canada to London. So when you move to a new place um, 
and you're a foreigner, he was a foreigner, I was a foreigner, you, it's, it's interesting. You become friends with people from other places faster than you become friends with people that are from there. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're both kind of experiencing this thing together and the people that are from there, they've been, they've grown up there. They have their own like friends and family, whereas you're these people from abroad. So, Mm -hmm. so he was one of my uh, first friends I made there. And when he moved to uh, LA after getting his HBO special, and his show legit, I'd moved back from London after nine years to Canada. So it worked out perfectly because he was just starting to tour theaters at that time. Oh yeah. So he was like, Oh, this is great that you move back because you'll, you know, you'll open all my Canadian shows. But the rule is that every time we return to a market, you have to do different material. And it's one of those things that's, you know, easier said than done. Usually we're in a market every year. Um, and you know, the average comic thinks, oh, no problem. But they don't realize it's like, no, 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 you have your bulletproof opener, you have your bulletproof, you have all these things. I'm like, I'm going to take those away from you right now. Yeah, strip it all down. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to send you back there in eight months from zero. And let's see how you do. It's it's a much bigger feat. Yeah. But it was like the most exciting and best thing he ever did. Because I did start to turn over my material far more aggressively because I'm like, oh my God, we're playing, you know, we're playing the Sony Center in Toronto again. Like I have to, you know, I have right. to make sure that not just that I can do okay, I have to do extremely well because I have to um, expose myself to that market. And I have to get the show up and running and kicking ass because Jim's like one of my best friends and I want him to have an awesome show. And right. if, I, if I go up there and suck dicks, then it's going to make it harder for him. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean so. th- there's a huge responsibility on those guys who are in the, big, in the beginning of the show to warm up the audience and do a great job. And it's, it's funny because you know, imagine if somebody goes to see you at that theater in Toronto the one year and then you guys come through the market the next year – and they see you come on stage, they'll probably recognize you from the last time, almost certainly. And I feel like most of the audience would probably expect that you're doing at least some material from the last time and be okay with it. Yet you guys are going above and beyond and squashing those expectations and just going, you know, way past them. So I think that's, first of all, it shows that you guys care a lot about your audiences and you want to keep it fresh, but it also shows that shows that you care about your art a lot, you know, and I, I think that's really uh, something to be commended for. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. Cause it's, it is fun. Like there is nothing. I mean, you're starting to get into the joke writing now. I mean, playing, playing a hit is one thing like, and I don't mean like going way back in your back catalog, but I'll even have something from four months ago, which is technically like a really new joke, right. but I'm like, I already know. Okay. That kills. So it's when it's when something like literally a week a day old happens and you say it and it works. That's like the most exciting thing because comedy is, it's just lightning in a bottle. Like it's, you know, it's like they're shooting stars sometimes. Like you just have to, you know, you have to remember the moment, you know, make a note. I mean, half my life is just, I I say something when I'm out with my wife and she says, that's really funny. You should write that down. Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're in an argument. I say something to her. Hold on, I'm going to go write this down, damn it. Yeah, I stop. I stop. And I'm like, this is really funny. She's like, are you fucking kidding me right now? I'm like, come on. You know, that's so funny. It's 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 paying for your next pair of shoes. So, yeah, like so it was, you know, I I, I do give on my actually on my last album, Stupid Shaming in the liner notes. I do thank Jim for that, for doing that, because He's a good enough comedian, obviously, that I could just keep, you know, okay, Tommy goes out and he cranks out his greatest hits and then, you know, he destroys and then I, you know, go on and kill after him. Exactly. He didn't do it because he was like worried about me killing and him not being able to follow it or anything. He just like, he just said like, you know, I'm giving you an opportunity and, you know, these people... Uh, are going to keep coming back to see me. And if they're going to keep seeing you, if they're seeing you crank up the same thing, that's not very interesting. But yeah. like, if they're going to keep seeing you turning it over and over, you know, you, they're going to be turned on to you. And there's not a lot you can actually, people think in like show business, like 
you can just do so many things for your friends, but you, you really can't. And the mm-hmm. one thing that Jim can do that he has complete control over is who opens for him. Yeah. So um, that's why he has me um, and then my our two other friends, um, they split America because it's a much bigger market. So the two of them split it. Okay. But that's why he has 100% control over it and has us do it and challenges us, you know, they they had they had they're in the same boat. They got to turn all their stuff over. Um, so I'm guessing they do. I stick to my I I stick I stuck to it when he told me to. Um, so I'm in a constant state of shitting my pants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like seriously. Going, so as I'm like looking at my baby, I'm like, do something. Come on, do something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so running I, around. Yeah, something's got to happen, you know, because I'm like, yeah, so. I think we're um, next – him and I together were just – we did Kelowna. We did the Prospera place, the arena there, and we did the uh, Save on Foods arena in Victoria. Nice. Um, and both those places we played a year ago. So that was a returning market, new material, arena shows. And there's not many comics that can you know, fill arenas. So Yeah, especially nowadays. It's tough, tough to find. Very Most- tough. It's great that you're getting out there and, and you know doing that with the gym, and I'm definitely going to try to make it out to the show next time you guys come through the area. And you you know you were talking about how you know just kind of sparring verbally and just coming up with jokes and you know saying that might be funny and writing it down and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. and coming up on the end of the show, you know Twitter it seems to be a really great outlet for you and somewhere that you can really connect with your fans. Uh, and, and not only that, but work out jokes. Um, but you mentioned that that fear that comedians often have about little things like, you know, adjusting the stage mic or the lights. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, a lot of comics also have a fear about speaking their mind, especially politically. Um, and I'm wondering if you have, you've had any blowback for your criticism of Donald Trump on Twitter, because for those who don't know, you have a very large following on Twitter and you've been very, very vocal against Donald Trump, uh, for a long period of time. Do you think that's cost you in any way? And, uh, if so, or if not, why? Um, I well, interestingly enough, so with Donald Trump, I I was one of the first critics of his, uh, which is why I have such a loyal following. So I used to write um, I used to write blogs for the Huffington Post. Yeah. And when he first announced that he was running, uh, I I immediately thought that it was insane, mm-hmm. and I also immediately thought this guy could win. And it, when, so it, there was a time where you would turn on the news and, uh, Kimmel, uh, Fallon, Colbert, no one would even mention anything about Trump or it'd be one little side joke. Now it's their whole monologue, right? Exactly. But from day fucking one, I said, this is real. This is a threat. This is scary. This is going to happen. And so I, um, began you know, being a very open critic and making fun of him. I started a hashtag when Trump is elected <laughs> and it was the top trend for 24 hours. Wow. Uh, my tweets were on CNN time, Washington post, you know, you, you name it. They were my, they were, they were on their sites or being shown on their shows and stuff. And I did some blog posts about it. Um, I live tweeted all the debates. Uh, I, I, th- I think, I think that I I gained fans because of it because I was so early to criticizing him right. that people knew me. Although I'm not like globally famous, like people knew like this face from Twitter going, "That's the guy that's really good at hammering Trump." Right. Um, so for the most part, it was a beneficial thing because it just snowballed and more and more people. And like, if I look at my, you know, tweets this week, there's, there's quite a few that are, you know, they have 5,000 retweets, 5,000 favorites and stuff. Yeah. And I have like 54,000 followers and I know people with a million followers that don't even actually get that much traction. That's it. Like if you do look at people's accounts, you know, I'll often get the same amount of traction as someone with, 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 you know, 20 times the amount of of followers as me. Right. So, which again, it doesn't matter necessarily who you are. It's the quality of what you're saying. 
and developing that audience. So I was early to Trump. And so a lot of people started following me and then it snowballed. Have people turned off me? I would honestly say like there's like three like comedians I know that were like super right wing who I like just noticed. I'm like, oh, when did you stop following me? Mm hmm. And I was like, interesting. You could have muted me. You could have anything. And you're a comedian. You're supposed to be like a little more open-minded and stuff. But yeah. I mean, I, I get I get I get a shit ton of you know messages, uh, or I I mean I get hammered with you know terrible tweets and death threats and messages like that. Um, but they're just from an account with you know four followers and a picture <laughs> of a MAGA hat, you know? Exactly. So I, I, I literally just scroll past them. Um, and it's only if they've like, uh, you know, done something like taken a picture of me and manipulated it, you know, like, you know, put a, I've seen all sorts of crap, you know, like it's right. when they start doing stuff like that, where it gets a bit creepy that you just hit the, you just hit the block report, block report. Exactly. And, so, yeah, I don't really – I just never really think about it. I just never really – I mean when I look at my notifications, there's so many of them. I just zip past everything and I don't care what people say. <laughs> like it just – it yeah. just – you know, unless it's like – again, death threat and they've just put a picture of me you know, with a fucking axe through my face or something. I've seen all sorts of weird stuff. But right. generally, people will often say that – um if they are going to criticize me, they will try and say that um, that I'm washed up or I'm a bad comedian. Mm -hmm. And I will always say, like, if you'd like to tell me in person, I'll be playing two sold out shows at the <laughs> Sony Center in Toronto, opening for Jim Jeffries to whatever, six or eight thousand people <laughs> on whatever date, you know, come um, to my meet and greet. Yeah. Um, or, or people will say, you know, like, uh, they'll talk about acting and stuff like i i guess we haven't really touched on the fact that I've, I've been in a few movies and things right are you aware of that i am yeah actually i was <laughs> okay. gonna bring that up too <laughs> okay um but yeah so uh they're like oh you know you're an extra and i will they're like oh you're only an extra in the dark night I, and i'll say extras don't have lines and close-ups um which i did um right. And if you want to go rewatch it to double check, that'd be great because I'll, we'll get another royalty. <laughs> Make sure so to stream it. I always tell people, yeah, go, 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 go double check that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I was in that movie for longer than that. You want to go check that again? Cause I'll just get more money. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but it's that thing. Like people can say whatever they want about you. They can say you're washed up or they can say I'm, you know, bad. And I'm like, I just put out another album. I'm playing clubs. I tour with Jim. I write constantly. I don't give a fuck what you say because I know I'm prolific. I know I'm a nice guy. I know I'm a fun person to have a beer with. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's so it's like I just ignore. I ignore all those people that try and come at me. But like I said, most of them, their profile always. It's it's interesting. The, the worst people on the internet. Their profile starts with God. Yeah. It's always like it's 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 always like God, then guns. Right. Um, then a sports team, then then family or something like that. Like they list like their their three sons' names last. But that's the order. It's always the really religious people that are the ones that are one hundred percent saying like the worst things to you. It's just yeah. interesting observation. What is it with the family too? Like somebody will tell me they want to come choke my throat and, and you know, put a dagger through my head and then I'll click and there's a picture of them and their nieces. And it's like, what is that exactly? Well, that's where, yeah, it, it, it is unbelievable. Um, I, I think, I think that my thing is, okay, if, so you're saying when you, when you, when you dig deeper into their profile, you see this, but their profile picture usually isn't them and the nieces. Yeah. Not the profile photo. Okay. So I, what I usually will say to people is often the people that are coming at you the worst, their profile picture is like something very generic. Like it's a MAGA hat or a mountain 
or a fucking gun or whatever. So they don't even have the courage to put their face behind it. They're using a fake name, you know, Smokey Jones 24. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, this is me. I'm straight up. This is my name. This is my picture. Like I'm not hiding behind anything yet. You are cowering behind this image yet talking tough. Right. But yes, if you some go down the rabbit hole, if you go click on their profile, yeah, you see them with their kids or something. And they're probably in camouflage and in a church parking lot, but yeah. it's, it's, it's just the weirdest thing. Um, and I think that like, I don't think people should be able to comment on anything unless they use their, I, I, th- I think, I think if people's name and address were basically their profile, you would get a lot less horrible people. That's true. I like, mean, there's nothing to hide behind and you make an interesting observation It's because people say that they'll come say it to your face, but the reality is they can't even say it to your face virtually. They can't even you, say you it have to your face, face virtually. I yeah. had, uh, yeah, I mean, and my, my messages are open on Twitter, which means even if you don't follow me, you can message me. Um, and I'll, I'll talk that on and off for a while, but I, I forget exactly what the incident was, but I had, it was if one of the shootings or something, one of the many in America, yeah. um, a news site, not fake news, a news site had reported something early, but it wasn't confirmed. And I had tweeted about it and then woke up and went to bed. And then it turns out like half an hour later, they're like, we were wrong. It wasn't a guy. It was a girl, whatever. Right. Yeah. So I had all this, like, I mean, big right wing people that were just destroying me because of it, but I didn't feel bad about it because I, I wasn't set out to do anything. I was just making a comment on what I saw on the news. Which you thought was accurate at the time. These people were like literally telling me to kill myself. And so I took the three biggest accounts and I just privately messaged them. And I said, um, if you look at the time, I saw this broadcast. Here's a link to it. I commented on that. Um, I was wrong. And uh, what do you want me to say? That's it. And, right. and every one of them was like, uh, uh, they didn't even know what to do. They were expecting some big showdown. But Did I was they respond? just so, uh, two of them did. But it was like with nothing, like it was like gotcha or whatever, like, okay, bro. And it was very minimal, you know. And these are like high profile, like entertainment figures we can assume. Yeah. Yeah. Just right. Yeah. Or um, right wing news people, stuff like that. So, but I was just saying like, that's where my thing was from. And uh, I deleted and I said, I deleted the tweet, but people had screen captured it and were like, you know, as as whenever Trump spells something wrong, I screen capture it as well. Right. But I explained. I didn't delete it. Um, I I didn't delete it because I changed my point of view. I deleted it because I was commenting on something inaccurate. Because I because I watched the news. They said this happened. I said this. And then I went to bed exactly. <laughs> and then to wake up to find, oh, my God, that's not what happened. And I I saw that on the news and then on my Twitter, I'm like, oh, my God, people are going to be freaking out at me. You know, like I knew it was going to I knew that was coming. And I'm like, OK, well, I'll, you know, I'll delete mine. But then everyone, like I said, people were tweeting me the screenshot being like, hey, pussy, you fucking deleted it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my come on. Yeah, that's just um, it's, it's so weird. This how, is how why people try to get. And again, they're all hiding behind. You know, they're hiding behind a picture of their Jeep. Yeah. Yeah. And a picture of their Jeep. And, you know, they all say, yeah, God guns, family, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's just, it's fascinating. The classic disguise, of course. So where do you get, uh, where do you get people from? Was it your YouTube comments, stuff like that, where people are mean or? Yeah, YouTube, I get the most of it. YouTube, I've got quite a few death threats. Um, on my one video, it was my first video that started getting a lot of traction uh, just on an independent video itself. It's at almost 150,000 views, and it was a pretty Good controversial video. Oh, thanks. And, uh, yeah, you know, people, it touched a nerve, and they got really upset. And it's funny. I actually was getting these prank calls recently, and I don't think I've even touched on this on this show, but I was getting these weird prank calls talking about my podcast Um and then the, the people were also asking me to buy all kinds of drugs, you know, which I don't know what that's about. 
I thought it was a cop or something like that at first, but it turns out I keep getting these calls and one time they forgot to block the number and the number was actually a contact in my phone, shockingly enough. Wow. Yeah. And this was somebody, it was a, a group of people who I thought I was friends with, sort of acquaintances with, we weren't actively friends, but they all had me on Snapchat and social media and they would respond to my things about the podcast saying good job and, and you know, we'd frequently talk. They'd drop into my work to say hello when they knew where I worked. And it turns out this whole time they're sitting there plotting, doing prank calls, secretly hating me. So stuff like that, you know, that bothers me a lot more than an anonymous voice because it's just, it shows intent and sneakiness. You know, I don't know if you've experienced anything like that, but that's, that's pretty bad too. We're going to hit a quick break and get into a comedy clip. This is a clip from Tommy Campbell. And this is a clip off his latest record, Stupid Shaming, which I highly suggest available on Apple Music, Spotify, and rotating on Sirius XM. And here he is with a clip called Quiet Audiences on TCMS. I've played in 35 countries. I I tour the world doing this. And sometimes Canada can be, like, really reserved. Like, and I, I am Canadian, so it, it is, a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a thing that you notice, like, you, you play some places, you go to, like, Ireland, you go to England, you go to Scotland, in the States, you walk on stage, they're like, woo, woo, and Canadians sometimes, it's like, they're, they're, they're just stare at you. <laughs> it is so weird. And, and then, like, you're doing your show, and you're like, fuck, I'm dying. And then afterwards, they're all, like, lining up to buy your CD, and I'm like, what happened? Like... <laughs> I thought you hated it, and they're like, oh no, you were very good. <laughs> Something makes us reserved that we just don't want to like let it rip, and that's not as fun. You want to let it rip, you want to have a good time, you want to go to the concert, and you want to cheer. You don't want to just be like, hmm, very good. It's, good. <laughs> it's no fun. Or think about like sex. Everyone has had sex with that really quiet person, right? Every girl, right? Every girl has had that one dude that's just on top of her, kind of like monotonously pounding away. And she's just under him, kind of freaked out, like... You know, people have enjoyed this before. Are you okay? Are you enjoying this? Yeah, you're very good. It's It's so weird. But in the same way, like, every guy has also slept with the girl that's just, like, lying there, and you're doing your thing. You think you've got all the moves, you know? You're, you know, you're being all awesome, and she's just lying there, and you're thinking, like, fuck, we agreed to this, right? Like, Twitter is, my friends aren't on Twitter, right? Like, Twitter is fans. So fans can be good for sharing stuff. But I'm, I'm saying when you ask your people you grew up with and your friends and coworkers and yada, yada, oh, yeah. and you put it on Facebook, and you're like, hey, I just made this. Can you give it a watch and a share? Um, it's the neglect that I find bizarre, like, Right. You know how hard it is to get people to support you um, that you know. So strangers are always willing and happy and excited to help you. But there's a weird thing with people you know are the ones you can't rely on. Like right. I will make a short and message them saying, hey, this is my thing. Do you mind sharing it? And I'll look at their page the next day and they've shared like two other videos from YouTube but not mine. And exactly. I'm like – I'm like, well, come on. Like, just is it really that painful to put it on your timeline? You know, it's going to be scrolled past and disappear, you know. But what I, so that's a thing I've noticed in our business in my long, you know, career in here, um, as I'm always hustling and trying, is that the, the lack of support, like I said, neglect you'll get from friends is unfortunately disappointing, which is why I, I don't even mention. You know, I will get people that say, oh, why didn't you tell me you were, you know, coming to Hamilton, whatever. And I'll say it's on my social media. Like, yeah, I my Facebook is just a private thing with family kind of now. Like if if you care and you want to see me, follow me like it's so easy. To, it's it's that easy. Like I, I tweeted I would be coming here 15 times. 
Um, <laughs> they all figured it out in this audience. Like, I'm sorry you didn't, but like, you, you know, that's the thing. If people, it's a weird thing when I'll, when I'll go to a town, I will get a lot of people to be like, Oh, why didn't you tell me? And, and I'll say like, so I'm supposed to individually contact yeah. everyone I know in that town, like friends, you know, like, like whatever from over the years and let them know. I'm like, that's not how it works. <laughs> I, I, exactly. that you, you're supposed to be paying attention on my end. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think, I, what was it that you were saying when you went with, uh, with your, uh, podcast with, with Gene, um, what venue was he at? Was the Gene Simmons band at? That was at the Edmonton Expo Center at Northlands. Okay, and you were saying that it was under attended. You felt? Oh, the concert, absolutely. I mean that 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 place can seat a couple thousand people, and there mm-hmm. was not even a thousand people there. Yeah, and okay, so you know, and and that doesn't make any sense because it's 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 Gene Simmons, an absolute rock icon. Um, even your pedestrian kiss fan would be there. Exactly. Um, so again, that, that, well, that falls down to how they decide, how the promoter decided to market that. You know? I don't think it was marketed very well. You know, I, that's what I mean. I like I don't think really they marketed it at all. That's, that's, a, that's a very, that's another sort of Canadian thing. Um, again, having toured with Jim who is constantly going back and forth between Canada and the States and just having, you know, having a beer and just talking with his promoters and just saying like, well, how is this different than when you do shows in the States and stuff? And just sort of learning about how venues approach things and stuff. It does seem like, um, you know, it does, it does sound like it can be harder to do business here. In Canada. Yeah, it does. If that's what I, if I'm hearing them right, like right. gym shows are always sold out and stuff, but there there are more. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just more. I guess just the more complications, more things to, more challenges they have to face. More, right. like like I remember doing. Wow, we were like we were in Regina or something, and Jim and I were in the green room like after the show, yeah. and just all of a sudden these just two guys in trucker hats and a girl just walked in. Hey, great show, Jim! And Jim <laughs> and I are like, "What the fuck is this?" Like we're like, "What's going on?" Right. What's happening right now? And they're like, and Jim's like, "Where's the security?" And then the security is usually like, uh, it's it's a lady in a folding chair doing Sudoku. Yeah. <laughs> like on her iPhone and literally like a retired woman, like in her like late sixties, Sarah Palin's sister. Yeah. It's just this lady just sitting there and they've just walked past her and it's happened to us a couple times. And, and another time someone tweeted pictures like of some people in our green room, like, Hey, we, we took some of your beers and stuff. Whoa. And yeah. And, and like, he just says that would never happen never happen in the states and he's like they they just the venue will provide actual security you know and we're not talking to people with machine guns or anything but they will have they will actually have people outside the door and outside the door to the door that simple but not a lady not a lady just sitting playing sudoku because that is what 90 percent of the venues that i've seen have and it's fascinating so even for music shows i've that now that you mention it it's almost nothing, almost nothing. Um, and when we played the National Arts Center, um, our tour manager was just fascinated because he'd recently done a show in Washington. And he's like, do you have any idea how much security there is? And like, because and like the NAC, like Justin Trudeau, could just at any time decide he wants to go to this concert, you know? So. Yeah. They, they, they will take some steps for security, you would think, right? But, like, that's what – in the States, that's what they have. Like, in Washington, like, you know, if, uh, if like, Nickelback's in town and Trump wants to go see his supporters, he could go <laughs> – <laughs> like, he could go see a show. But they'll have heaps of security. Um, but, like, when we showed up to the – I remember we showed up to the stage door and 
there was like a couple fans there and Jim's like, Oh, hello. You know, gets a photo with one, whatever. Yeah. And then the lady, you know, buzzes us in and the guys follow us in they and followed you in the room. Yeah. And then, and then a tour manager's like, what's with these guys? And they're like, no, no, we're coming to the show. <laughs> and, and I'm um, seriously. The, and so they're like, no, no, we're coming to the show. And, uh, the tour manager's like, well, this is the stage entrance. And the lady's like, oh, it's a long way for them to go around to the front. Fellas, you just come in here. And Jim's wow. like, what is going on? And then we all got in this little elevator with these guys that were like pretty much harassing Jim being like, you know, oh, you know, are you going to do your gun control? You do this, you know. No. And I'm just thinking like this would never happen. And it does put some fear into you. Like, well, if you can just walk up to me, who else can? Seriously, you, know? you would be tackled in most places. Yeah, and so it's really odd. And so I often hear, like, again, that would never happen. And so it's just perspective, you know. But if, if all you've ever played is one place, then you think, well, that's normal. That's how things work. But when you are constantly on tour, it's things are kind of a, a shock to you, you know, when – when things are like that, you know? Exactly. Yeah. You, you're definitely not staying accustomed to one thing. You're just keeping yourself, you know, versatile, really awesome stories and commentary. I, we've covered so much ground. There's only one more thing I really want to ask you about. And that is your extensive acting work. You've had, of course, extensive experience writing, directing, and of course being on screen. Uh, you've been on Doctor Who, Supernatural, Arrow, The Dark Knight, and much more. So what can you tell me about those experiences um, anything that stands out there? Um, I think, well, I think the most exciting thing is just when you see yourself on screen, because right. when, when you film stuff, um, I mean, I, I, I revert back to, I, I remember hearing an interview with Brian Cranston and they asked him, you know, like, what was the most fun thing, you know, you ever filmed and he was like, fun, like, it's not fun. Like there's so much pressure. Mm -hmm. It costs millions to film something, uh, and you, you know, you got to remember your lines, you got to remember your stands. So when I think about actually filming stuff, I just kind of remember being partially, you know, quite nervous yeah. because they often change things on the fly. You know, they'll change lines as mm -hmm. you're going. And if you get them wrong and you have to reset the scene, like it involves firing a gun or something it can take a long time to get everyone back to the starting positions and reload the cameras and will can literally cost them a hundred thousand dollars because you said the wrong line. Yeah. And that's all on you. So it's all on you. It 100% is. And so I've always delivered and done well, but it's because I've prepared myself. Um, but it doesn't mean I'm not nervous. So when I think back to, to filming, it's more like the relief at the end of the day, like when, when you wrap, um, knowing you've got it well, but then you're kind of nervous for a while going, will it be edited out of the movie? Cause right. that happens. Um, and then finally seeing yourself on the big screen, which for me, like the first time I saw myself on the big screen was on IMAX for the cast and crew screening of the dark Knight. So that was like mental, right? That wow. was one of the most amazing experiences of my life because, I was one of those guys that got cast in that movie that was an actual Christopher Nolan fan and a Batman fan. Oh, so, crazy. And what a movie, too. Holy. Amazing, right? So so I, you know, got to see that before anyone. And, um, yeah, that was just a really cool experience. And then I, that was, like, the private screening. And then I got to go to, like, the red carpet one in Leicester Square, you know, like in Piccadilly Circus uh, in London. Um, so... You know, that that was like an amazing experience to be part of something big. But I just cannot stress how terrifying it is. Um, and it's just that never ending thing like you audition and that process can be a bit nerve wracking. And then they get recalled for another audition and then you get the part and then you got to wait to see if you make the movie, yeah. you know, like to see if it all happens. But um there's just more so like interesting things like um, I did a movie uh, called Edge of Tomorrow um, mm -hmm. with Tom Cruise. And when I, when I filmed that, like I have the script in my office here, it was called All You Need Is Kill, which I think is a better title. Um, yeah. There's a lot of controversy over why they changed it. But 
um, I pilot this uh, giant drop ship that uh, um, I like. I, I fly Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt um, in this like rescue mission thing, um, basically. And they had this entire ship actually built, and it was on these like. Um, some sort of mechanical lifts like it could actually turn side to side wow. and there was a green screen all the way around it because we had another guy that was gunning out the, we had a guy with a machine gun like shooting out the side and and we did all this uh incredible flying and it was super intense like to film because the whole time like in my shot was me an extra like they had a guy playing a co-pilot that was just there for like he didn't say anything. He was just there. Yeah. And then Tom, Tom Cruise is right between us. Like he's standing there, um, with me. And so, Insane. you know, I had to, I had to turn and like, you know, like he comes into the cockpit and I have to turn and, you know, he comes to like check in on how the flight's going, whatever. And so when he comes in, I have to turn and look at him and I'm like, we're literally face to face. And, and, you know, I don't care who you are. It's still like that's fucking Tom Cruise. Of I course, mean, that's, you can't you know, avoid I, that. I grew up. I grew up like Top Gun, Days of Thunder. Um, I love. I still think Cocktail is the funniest, unintentionally funny movie ever made. Um, the way people watch The Room, I think they should watch Cocktail. It's very funny. Um, and uh, Magnolia, uh, Jerry Maguire. Like I'm just like so. You you have to like be able to like put that aside. Yeah. And every time I've done like an acting job when things change on the fly. Um, I always say to my wife, I said, if I wasn't a comedian, I don't think I would have been able to handle that experience. Like I think other actors, there's, there's are some times that in my life where I think they might've kind of like had a bit of a breakdown or crumbled, but because I have more the ability to think on my feet because of years of stand up and the ability to really take a punch because I've, I have had, you know, horrible shows yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's the worst feeling in the world. So, um, that does help you stomach certain critiques and anxieties. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, I, I, I definitely think that that helps, but that was one of the coolest experiences. Very intense to have to like look at Tom Cruise and everything. And I did tons of stuff. And then only a small amount made the final cut. But you don't know that until you're seeing it. You're like, oh, why didn't they have the thing with me and the machine gunner? And But, you know, they have reasons for editing. And You must you wish they'd let you know a bit in advance. No, it's not how it works. It's just yeah. not how it works. They, the, way, the way filming is, is you'd get as much coverage as possible. And then you try and tell the story with as least coverage as possible. And when you're doing a scene with someone like Tom Cruise... Uh, you know, like they're going to favor him. Like the audience doesn't want to see me. They want to see him. Right. So, so it's that thing where you, you, some of you, half my lines, it's, it's him reacting to, you know, at the back of my head turning and saying, him. you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's because they did do footage of mm -hmm. me saying it, but again, they'll always favor the star. Right. And you know, if you're listening pay attention to a movie from now on when you see not a co-star, but someone that shows up and has three or five lines, you'll notice like most of the time you'll see the star talking and listening. And then the other person will just kind of be established. Um, they don't really favor them because again, it's, you're, you're not, it's not who you want to see. So right. I think that's the cool thing about filming is, you know, you get to do these, bizarre things like go in this giant drop ship that costs millions and be with Tom Cruise. But, it, you know, there's a lot of pressure with it. Uh, yeah. And you can, and the travel is cool when you film stuff and you go to different places. But yeah, I mean, I've, I filmed in Thailand and South Africa, but again, <laughs> I just warned people. They're like, Oh, it's amazing. You went to South Africa. I'm like, yeah, I got off the plane and was taken immediately to the set after yeah. four, a 14 hour flight like it's not like hey we're gonna give you a pina colada and let you chill by <laughs> the pool and, and then beat off for a night and then come back you, hey, know, you forgot like, your sombrero get back here yeah yeah no it's <laughs> it's like all right 
straight to, you know, we're, we're measuring you up and then we're filming you. Like, it's like, oh, my God. Um, which is why, you know, a lot of people get flown first class and stuff because it costs so much money to film that they have to have people, you know, relaxed and good to go as early as possible. And prepared to, to deliver yeah, as you, as you say. Prepared. Yeah. It's, it's, it's preparation so much. Sometimes I forget other stuff I've done, but yeah, you said Dr. Who, that was cool. I still get fan mail for that. Dr. Nice. Who fans are very loyal as are, uh, kiss fans they sure yeah. are which is something that you love too right absolutely um i sent you some pictures for fun because i'm yeah. aware that you're a big kiss fan so yeah so i sent you a picture so in my i've tweeted this out before or usually if i'm having beer in my basement people have seen this but so i have a stern kiss pinball i have the back of one um, above my bar and it lights up and flashes and does all the cool things and it's signed by um the factory and what happened, the reason I have this is because when Jim was playing Chicago, Jim has, he has a bunch of pinball machines in his much bigger house. And he likes pinball so much they went and toured the factory. Huh. And uh, with, with my friend Jason, who's the other guy that opens for him, and um, they gave them some things and uh, they were cool enough uh, to say, hey, our friend Tommy with loves kiss and he'd think this is pretty cool. So wow. one day, one day this showed up in the mail and that was pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> Must've been a big surprise. Yeah, it, it was, it was really cool. And, and oddly enough, so I have a new baby and kids like lights mm -hmm. and it's my favorite, my baby's four months old and he just sits and stares at it. Yeah. Like it's his favorite thing to look at is like this, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's it's the classic Stern pinball one, you know, and it's uh, and how demons cool breathing there's fire. another kid who's being brought up with that visual of those four iconic figures and, you know, having that be a, a part of their childhood. I think that's fantastic. As he should be. Yeah. Um, but the other one, I, the other picture I sent you was because I lived in London. I went. So you're aware of that show that I went to. Yeah. Wasn't that the one where they first did some of the new stuff from Sonic Boom? Yeah, because yeah, it was the sonic boom over Europe was the tour, which I actually right. saw them at Wembley for that. But this one was – it was a small set list. I, I probably have it. I mean you could probably pull it up on Setlist FM or something. I think it was quite short, like maybe 12 songs. Now, what it was um, – they did – this This is the thing that really bothered me because it didn't get enough press. So – the HMV Forum, the only time I'd ever been there was to see the Tragically Hip because every summer or at some point in the year, the Tragically Hip would play London. And there was enough Canadians that lived there that they could sell out, you know, a thousand seater kind of thing. Yeah. And so um, that venue happened to be in my neighborhood and I'd seen the Tragically Hip there and I thought that was crazy that I'd like, you know – strolled down to this like smaller theater and you know and i'm you know with my british wife explained to her i've seen these guys in like arenas and stuff yeah. but this but then when kiss announced they were doing a show there i was like what i don't understand and then i read a little more and they did a show for charity and it was 100 percent for charity which is what made it interesting um it wasn't a portion of the proceeds just the it whole was, thing Everything went to Help for Heroes, which is the British equivalent to, I guess, like the Wounded Warrior. That's it's right. for in, injured servicemen. So, uh, you your your ticket um, had your credit card and picture on it, and you could only eat. There was no. They made it impossible to scalp the ticket. Yeah. Now, like U two is doing this nowadays, or something with their most recent tour, but it, but that but they're not, they're doing it for profit. Like they're just being dicks. Yeah, they just uh, want you know it what all. I mean? Like so so Kiss doesn't do this for all their shows. They did it for this show because they were so concerned about the charity money. So that's how awesome Kiss that's is. Great. So they had merchandise that was made up just for that show, um, like completely specific, and again, hundred percent to charity. So I was like blown away how awesome it was. Wow. Managed to get tickets. Um, uh, my wife and I went. Now the thing is, it was London, and London doesn't have like hot summers like like we get. Um, like their summers like two weeks long. 
like we actually get a full summer here in you know Canada. So we're lucky compared to them. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, no, they, like they they have like the worst. You know, their summers just rain. Um, yeah. It's terrible. But but they will get a few crazy hot days. This happened to be one of them. And the thing that goes with that is they just don't have air conditioning. Like, mm. like here here's the thing. Like when I lived in London, some buddies came to visit me, and we went to my local pub for a beer one night. And we sat down, I ordered us three pints, and anyway, we had cheers, we all take a sip. And my friends are like, this beer's warm. And I was like, no, it's not. And they're like, you don't think that's warm? I'm like, no, it's cold. And they're like, oh, you've lived here too long, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you just, you my, my, my standard had completely changed. And again, when there's no air conditioning anywhere, you just get used to like, okay, I guess it's just really hot. You know, you just, that's, it's you're just fine with a fan whatever right but when you're wearing the demon outfit and breathing fire like yeah like they were they were dying up there i mean it was we were all packed in this little venue like sardines um it was over 30 degrees out and it was just sweltering in there an old brick building um it was just i mean i remember my jeans like not my shirt my actually jeans were dripping wet like wow um, yeah so I even I, read reports about the heat all the way here in Canada. It was so hot. Well, now that you, you mention it. But I, uh, yeah, it was this crazy heat wave. But basically, some people were critical of the short set list. And I said, like, it just as a performer myself, like, I, I've been on stage when it's brutally hot. And it does not make it any easier. It makes it extremely hard. And these guys are older. They're wearing um, an insane amount of gear plus the fire um and the makeup your body can't breathe so uh i i completely thought i i just thought it was crazy when people were criticizing the show at all for yeah. the duration because i was cause like it's going to charity and, and to top it off it's all the charity yeah. so so most of the people were thrilled with it but of course the few complainers the same kind of people that you know like with your podcast with gene when they they thought he was being rude or something it's like yeah you know, like I, I think people just look for problems sometimes, um, and uh, to me, it was one of the most special, intimate, amazing Kiss shows I've ever seen in my life, and I was so glad that I went. I'm glad I went to charity, and I just, from a fan to another, I thought it'd be, you know, cool to send you those pictures. Absolutely, it is very cool. And actually, now that you mentioned this show, I did pull up the set list. They did. 14 total songs and they actually did the it wasn't of sonic boom it was of it was on the sonic boom tour but they did the first debut of hell or hallelujah from monster <laughs> is um, this hell or hallelujah show. yeah 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 that's yeah. what it was yeah yes that's what they did must Just have been a bit of a shock two. right after deuce <laughs> you know your man is working hard he's that's worth it right <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm a big i'm a big kiss fan which is again why i think the movie Step Brothers is one of the greatest movies ever made Hilarious! I saw it way too young, by the way, in theaters. Oh I, yeah, they weren't oh, supposed worth, to let me and my grandmother in there. <laughs> it's worth a rewatch to anyone, um, and it's a, and it's a great, um, it's a very accessible, uh, it's a good introduction to Kiss for many people. It's fantastic. So a lot of people, you know, they'll say, "Oh, that's how Gene is," and Gene is the businessman. He is. He's written books about it. Um, but he also is a very caring, compassionate guy that yeah. could have been doing anything that night. Like he didn't need, um, he didn't need to do that show. No, um, they did it purely for charity. Um, it was obviously 100% sold out in seconds. And when I when I talked about the coverage, I was just surprised that there wasn't more news crews there. Yeah. saying like this is mental they're doing this 100 percent for charity like in that sense i thought there should have been more awareness but that's not up to kiss that's more down to the charities press should have had um should have been more in contact um yeah. with with the press saying just so you know kiss are doing the show like it just really drilled into people's heads a hundred percent to charity i mean it's just i don't know it's unheard of i i see shows all the time that are uh, you know, it's a portion of the proceeds, a portion of the profits go to. And what does that mean? That might mean $50, right? Exactly. So, it could be you know, 0. Like, 0.002%. Yeah. 
they give you nothing. So, so I, yeah, I was, I was really um, happy to go and support and, you know, I've seen them a few times over the years. Um, but that was a, that was a pretty special one. I, I do hope to see them again. Um, I think they should be coming through sometime pretty soon. I think they're calling it a quits here soon though. That's, that's what I've heard. I, well, yeah, because I read the thing about, um, about, was it Gene saying that there should be like a reality show choosing the Paul. next lineup? Because, yeah, him and Paul choose the next lineup of Kiss, right? So, I mean, that's the idea when you're all dressed the way they're dressed. Yeah. See, whenever I'm at a show, right, like, I'm like a real fan. You're a real fan. Mm -hmm. But I know that like a good chunk of an audience is just like they just they just like four songs. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, let's go do that this weekend or that would be cool. I love those four songs, you know. Um, and then once they hear them, they realize, oh, I know a lot more Kiss songs than I thought. Once they're there. Exactly. Once they're there. Um, in like, you know, I – I took a friend with me to. Uh, I'm 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 a bigger Guns N' Roses fan than I'm a Kiss fan. I'm a, I'm a huge Guns N' Roses fan. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, it was it was crazy. <laughs> I, had a, I had an extra ticket, and a friend of mine came, and he he really just he, you know he considered himself to be someone that loves them, and he literally knew like going into the show like welcome to jungle paradise city right. and they played for three hours yeah and, that was a crazy uh, tour it's amazing yeah i saw it and i saw it in seattle and in vancouver um and and i actually saw them six times in england with the previous lineup Damn. which again to be honest they were just as good with that other lineup like a, an amazing musician's an amazing musician like for sure like these people like see my friend was like oh you know slash 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 and i'm like you don't know any have you read his book do you know anything about him like how yeah. you just you just he's just the guy in the hat and you think he's badass like you know <laughs> like there's you, you you have no idea right no they didn't um, have to uh, deal with him for years on end abs absolutely absolutely so i had seen those marathon concerts in europe um and yeah, it would have been cool to have the familiarity. But I was I was at the uh, London O2 Arena. I went. I mean, I would go both nights, right? Like big fan. For sure. And I saw, I saw the shows where Izzy Stradlin joined them, and I saw the shows where Duff joined them. Nice. So I had seen those things, um, but it was cool to see this tour because the budget was better. Like their their screens and the scope of it was a bit bigger yeah, it was and big i time. think that i think that although axel was quite happy um then he's even happier now yeah. and he's someone too that people think like he's like this asshole i'm like have you seen like how much he laughs and jokes on stage and how actually jovial he is and and how how he is between songs and after like he does he is like you know what you are he's all like hardcore axel right but then he's like how's everybody doing tonight <laughs> he's especially just in like, interviews he has this cadence about yeah. it. it's not threatening at all he's so like he's just like he's a rock star that's what he does but like yeah it, when he's hammering out a song but he's not going to talk like that in conversation like the first time i saw them was at wembley arena where i've also saw uh kiss the sonic boom over europe tour and i remember at one point in the show axel's like so apparently uh with Ticketmaster, there are some people here. Uh, we're gonna draw at random, and we're actually doing a second concert tonight at a private venue. Huh. Um, so uh, I guess we're gonna announce those names later on. And then all of a sudden, he would be like, "Yeah, scream it into Live and Let Die" or whatever. And I was like, what, <laughs> "A second show? What's going on? What is he talking about? A second show? Holy crap!" And then, and then, the, and then the show ends, and they all come out and they do their bows, and he's like. He's so Axel, like, I hope everybody get home safe. I heard that the trains don't run that late, but I hope you all get and you've enjoyed. And it was, like, so nice. And I was front row center, <laughs> like, leaning on the stage, right? Wow. And I'm like, and he walks away. I'm like, well, what, what about the second show? <laughs> well, what, what happened? I'm standing there with my Ticketmaster ticket. And then everyone's filing out. And then about 15 minutes later, we're talking 
people sweeping out, house lights up, maybe 30 percent of the people still in there. Maybe. He comes walking back on stage. He's like holding some Heineken. No. And, and he's got like a, a list. He's like, but, but he was still talking like it was a full house because he's Axel. He's a rock right. star. You know, he, he was not like, he didn't look out and go like, oh, everyone's gone. He's like, yeah, um, apparently I was supposed to read these. I didn't realize because no one handed it to me. And, you know, I was just singing my songs. But uh, <laughs> And he just stood there and, like, read these lists. He's like, you know, he's like Bryce Tennerson, Mike Johnson. He was just going wow. through these list of names. And I was just standing there going, none of those are mine. Yeah, seriously. You, you know, know, like, like yelling your yeah. name to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, he, <laughs> and then he was like, thanks again, rock and roll. And then... And, of course, people heard him, so then they're all trying to run back in and, you know. Uh, but, I, yeah, I didn't draw my name. But I just thought he was just so cool. And if you actually go on YouTube and see, like, videos where people have met him, like, outside a tour bus and stuff, he signs everything. He takes every picture. He's, like, completely cool. Like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm a big fan. But since we're talking Wembley Arena, um, as you can see, I, I enjoy talking about other people more than myself um, hey we, we gotta talk about everything on here that's what it's all no about. no but i'm saying like in life like i find interviews are weird because i don't like that's why i have time to try and ask you a question yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really like talking about myself that much even though we're supposed to in our business whatever right um so okay so kiss at wembley arena um one of the greatest things ever uh so paul stanley um he's like he he says he's like I want to see how how amazing my audience looks because I know there's so many beautiful people out there. <laughs> I want to see how good you look. And then he turns to like the big screen behind him, and and then it's still like just a shot of like you know like Gene or just like this band on stage, right? Yeah. So he turns back to the crowd and he's like, you know, there are so many fantastic fans here tonight, and I want to see them on the big screen. And he turns back and it's still just this. <laughs> <laughs> And he turns again. He's like, I want to see you on the screen. <laughs> and the next time he turns back, he goes, hey, asshole. Crowd shot, screen two. <laughs> oh, shit. Completely broke uh, his voice. <laughs> and it was the most fucking amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. He didn't ask him if he wanted a vodka and orange juice first? <laughs> no, he just said, he just, he just, yep, just. Oh completely switched, gosh. completely switched out of his voice, and said, "Boom, right there! I want a crowd shot, whatever, screen two, whatever. You know, he's a camera three, screen two, whatever." He said, and then he made a comment like, "Was that so fucking hard?" He's like, "Do you realize like, I'm the goddamn CEO of this organization? Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if I have a star on my face." Yeah, <laughs> it's like <laughs> so that. But but to me, like, as as if you see a lot of shows, it's like it like those moments are. Um, amazing, yeah. You know, like when you see. I mean, as a performer and as a fan, when you see things like that um, go wrong or get broken, you 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 a get to see a professional deal with them, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's one of the main things. Like, I think one of the other crazy things I've seen at a show was a Radiohead show. I was in the front row, and the guy next to me just fainted. Oh, and um yeah so i started jerking off on him and <laughs> no i'm kidding sorry so no this guy this guy just like i, I see him i see him wobbling around really weird and i nudged my friend i said i don't know what's up with this guy and then right in the front i could see tom york had noticed him as well right. and then all of a sudden the guy drops and tom york just stops singing and he actually says stop the song security this man down here very english he said he's had a fit He's had a fit. He's he's had a fit. He needs medical attention right away. Everybody give him some space and then we all like backed off. Security came and they took this guy away. Um and then the second he was carted away, he turned back to the band and he said something like with a third verse, second chorus, and they started playing like they'd press play on a CD. Wow. It like they didn't restart a song. They went right back into it like the exact note. Oh, that's and crazy. It was, it was one of the most, yeah, impressive things I'd ever seen. It was, it was very cool. So that again, is beautiful uh, watching a professional in their space adapting to something that's thrown thrown at them. Because you know, like in stand up, it's one thing. You know, you're you have to adapt to everything that's thrown at you in that room. But it, you know, at a concert, it's certainly not like that. So that that's really interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, it was very, very cool when I think of like over the years, the different uh, you know, places I've seen. The first concert I ever saw, I mean, no real story to this, it just simply was Edmonton. Was I, um, I don't know if you realize, but I did grow up in Calgary. Okay. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Calgary and then I moved to Toronto. Then I moved to London, England, then to Vancouver. Right. But I went to high school in Calgary and it was the Rolling Stones Voodoo Lounge at uh, Commonwealth Stadium. Oh, and um, I, uh, it was on a Friday night. And so I had to actually skip school to go. Ooh. And um, yeah, I, I, me and three other friends did. And we drove up to Edmonton and we had to organize. We were going to stay at my friend's aunt's place. And we drove up, uh, we saw the show and it was like, late fall it was freezing cold outdoor show um at the very back like the worst seats possible the worst seats but it still was like it was my that was my first concert I ever saw so i can still like see my pov of like watching this food lounge show but i remember after the show we weren't old enough to drink yet we weren't you know all we could do was like go to like go get something to eat and then we went back to my uh buddy's aunt's house <laughs> and so we, we i remember now we showed up at her house and she had no idea who my friend was because um, right. he just, you know, like when people say, oh, that's my aunt, but they don't, they leave out the fact that, oh no, it's your great aunt. Exactly. Like, <laughs> they, this is what they just, you know, you just call someone like, even like you have like a parent's friend. Oh, it's my uncle John. It's not actually my uncle. He's my dad's buddy, but we call them that. Right. Right. So his great aunt was like 92 years old. Didn't know up from down, completely senile. Oh. And when we showed up, didn't know who he was and phoned 911. Oh. Did they come? Yes. <laughs> you guys waited? You're like, well, wait, we need to deal with this. It was, it was, yeah, well, we, we actually didn't know she called. She, she okay. just said, like, go away, boys. I don't know. I don't want any trouble. I don't <laughs> yeah. want any trouble. I'm like, what the fuck is this, Colin? You said we're going to crash here. And we were all, like, exhausted, you know. And I don't want to buy uh, any jazz cigarettes. Yeah, I don't want your jazz <laughs> cigarettes. I don't, want your, I don't want your mops and Tupperware. And then, yeah, the, the police showed up. And then, and then it was really weird because we had to, like, get his mom on the phone and talking to her. And, uh, and then we eventually did stay in this house. Oh, you did. Like we, we did stay in there after all this negotiations with your mom, refreshing. You do know this person, you know, yeah, yeah. But I was just like sleeping on the couch. I'm like, am I gonna wake up with like a steak knife in my yeah. chest? Like, <laughs> can you have because, a good sleep? Yeah, well, because it's she's gonna forget at some point. <laughs> so we just got out of there like the crack of dawn. Um, but anyway, that was uh, that was my first time. That's a show in, in Edmonton. I don't know how, how many of your listeners are familiar with where you live. Um, Alberta is the number two province in Canada that listens, so I'd say a pretty good amount. And uh, most really? of our audience is in North America. Yeah, BC is number one. Is it okay? This is very interesting. Yeah, I'm always curious because, like, with what I find, like with my albums, um, and my social media, and my short films, everything is America is what I find um, a small percentage of my audience, like a percentage, but for certain things is Canada. So I wasn't sure Like you just never know, you know, who's going to listen to you and stuff, but it's exactly. interesting when you can, you can actually, um, you can see, I'm guessing you can see their demographics the way I can have an artist log into Apple music and I can be like, wow, yeah. That's weird. Like in Sweden, they really like this one track off my album. Like exactly, it, you can see where stuff's played and stuff. Yeah, episode so. by episode or track by track, and it's it is interesting because you know the places that I have the most connections out of is actually where I do the best. Because in in the the United States, we do the best in California as a state. So it's like you know we look at Joey Diaz and Adam Carolla and people like that. It does make sense. Yeah, absolutely, it makes sense as well, and that's that's where I have a lot of, um, a lot of traction as well. A lot of loyal people, like I said, second date people that will buy your album and buy the next one, uh, and, and show up at, at stuff. You know, it's, um, it's amazing. Are you ever going to be doing a live show or I might be asking this and you've done one already? No, I actually, I haven't, but that's something I want to start planning is a live podcast with a bunch of comics or something and just, and just, you know, fill a place 
and just do a really fun event. And then, you know, if it goes well, maybe make it a frequent thing if we can find a spot to actually, yeah. you know, book that at. No, that sounds cool. The only the only word you have me at is bunch. Um, yes. Because <laughs> that's always the north. This is another thing when back to time of comedy here and in Europe. Um, here often when you go to a show, there's like eight people on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my wife, she said, like, having seen this show in North America, she's like, has the comedians ever considered what it's like to be an audience member right. when you're just seeing like a revolving door? Just when you start to like someone, they have to leave. And yeah. then this new person comes on and they're just completely switching. Whereas the shows there would have, I mean, at, at the most four acts, including the MC mm-hmm. um, at the most. But I always see like listings for shows in Vancouver and they're like 12 people. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's, it's just confusing to them. It's a lot. Um, so I always think it's good to, uh, yeah, to, to, to limit, to limit it. Like, I mean, even if, if you went to see, like, say, let's say like there are people like, like at Jim's level that will have like four people open for them. Yeah. And I get it because they're trying to give those people exposure, but it's just, it's just too much. It's yeah, like it becomes more of a, a, it's more similar to an open mic than an actual comedy show, an even an actual comedy. big thing. Like when I open for Jim, and if if you are your listeners, if you have this, if you have a big listenership in Alberta and BC, then these people have seen me because I am the guy that repeatedly opens for them. But they'll know that when I bring Jim on, so I finish, and I say, "Stay in your seats." I'm going to walk off stage. Jim's going to come on stage because people like don't believe me. They think that, you know, I'm going to go off and then the lights are going to come back up. Yeah. But that's not the way we, we have to use with like union rules and everything. Like we just have to utilize as much time as possible. A lot of, a lot of artists are trying to pad things out and make it feel like people had a longer show than they did. But with Jim, he, he, he does as much time as he can. Like he wants as much time as he can. So, so for us, it's, I get everyone going, make them laugh. Everyone's in their seats and then say, all right, you ready to bring on Jim? You know, everyone goes nuts. And I go, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to walk off stage. It's going to be like a 30 second pause and then Jim's going to come out. So That's awesome. don't you, don't you dare go anywhere because he is coming out right now. Like, and, and, uh, and yeah, that's exactly. So well, people will know if, if, uh, if they're, if they're, Listening and from those places that have, I guess, um, seen us, uh, yeah. They'll know that you're the guy. And by the way, folks, I got to tell you that that, that's a super cool approach. I got to tell everybody listening though, you know, they've listened through the, through the long haul here and obviously they're very interested. If you like stand up comedy, Tommy's latest record came out, um, off the top of 2017 uh, stupid shaming. I highly recommend it. You can get it on Spotify and Apple Music, and of course, you can check it out on SiriusXM. It's airing um, on their channels. And uh, just like I say, you know, as a fan of stand-up, somebody who's worked in a club for two and a half years uh, at one point in time, you know, I've watched a lot of stand-up, and this is a really, really solid disc, um, and also very timely. It's a really good commentary. You know, stupid shaming on something that I also believe we should be doing. So, Tommy, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And where can people find you online? Yeah, uh, well, th- again, thanks for having me. I'm glad we finally uh, got to connect like this, and I, I hope to come back another time. For sure. Um, you're a treat to talk to. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. Tommy Campbell, so M-R-T-O-M-M-Y-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. So, Mr. Tommy Campbell. Uh, uh, Sorry if I'm spelling that out for you, but everyone forgets the P in my name. That's right. People, people forget it all the time, man. I get people going, hey, why didn't you get back to me? And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, like I'll get comedy clubs or something. They'll be like, we tried to book you, but you didn't get back to us. And I'm like, show me the sent email. And I'm like, yeah, it's there's there's a, there's a P in Campbell. So anyway, Mr. Tommy Campbell on Twitter. And then I, I do have an Instagram as well. Same thing, Mr. Tommy Campbell. Um that's more food pictures and stuff, but I still, I still screenshot my tweets and put them on there uh, to spread the good word. And my Facebook is Tommy Campbell Comedian. Um, those exist. You can, if you're not on Twitter, add me on those. You can message me. You can say hello. You can tell me you hate me, whatever you want. They're uh, God, guns, and family. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I'm mostly Twitter is my main place because it is my sounding board. 
uh, it is where I hammer Donald Trump, tweet out jokes, um, and that's my favorite place. So try me there. Huge shout out to Tommy Campbell for giving us a large amount of his time to drop a tremendous amount of knowledge. He dropped it all, and uh, I took a lot from that conversation. We kept talking for about an hour after this recording, and Tommy has a great business mind, you know, so it's, it's really cool being able to pick his brain about these kinds of things. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Cassius Morris Show. I hope you had a great listening experience. You can listen to us every week. There's a podcast that drops on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Libsyn, our RSS feed, Podbean, basically anywhere you can listen to podcasts. If you are listening to on any of those services, please give us a positive rating. It helps us get visibility on those platforms, um, and it's overall very good for the show. We also have video content every single week that drops with the podcast at youtube.com slash Cassius Morris. So please subscribe to that channel. We're on our way to a thousand subscribers so we can start getting paid. I'm also on a radio show every week here in Edmonton, Canada called Comic Genius. And you can check us out at Comic Genius. That's genius with a J. ComicGenius.ca. We air every Wednesday, 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, and we do take callers as well as guests. However, if you're not a night owl like that, which, you know, many aren't, you can catch the replay on our archive the next day, and it stays up after every show. So that's comicgenius.ca, and tune in to myself and Norm on the show. I think we do a good job, and it's been fun uh, steering the ship as the co-pilot over there. My Twitter is at Cassius Morris. My Instagram is at Cassius Morris underscore. And you can like the podcast on Facebook at facebook.com slash Cassius Show. Please do one or all of these if you do use these platforms. It makes it a lot easier to connect with you guys and, of course, for you guys to connect with me. And for all email inquiries, it's CassiusBusiness at gmail.com. Maybe you want to send me some music to play on the show. Maybe you're a comedian with a clip you want played on this show. Maybe you want to be a guest on this show or you want someone else to be a guest on this show. Hell, maybe you hate the show and you just want to let me know. For all I care, send all those inquiries and I hope to hear that and much more from all of you guys. I hope you guys stay safe. I hope you guys um, have the happiest week you can, the most positive week you can, and I will check in with you guys next week, and I sure hope the same can go for me. Until next time, this is Cassius Morris saying, Rock on.